Hey, Nick. Um, saw you at me on the pull request. Is everything okay? Hey, Jamie. Yeah, I'm trying to do a parser combinator for uh, implementation of a parser for the grammar that you gave me for the really cool calculator. And I'm just having trouble oh, uh, making continuous integration work out. Okay, yeah, let me um, remind myself of what that issue was um, before we take a look at the, the pull request. Um, okay, so you're implementing a parser for this grammar, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's got things like addition, negation, multiplication, uh, and, and negation. Uh, and uh, I think I've implemented it properly using parser combinators, but for some reason, the CI is just failing. Right, okay, yeah. Um, just to remind myself, these are all meant to be left associative, yeah. Okay, let's check out your um, your pull request then and um, see what's gone wrong. Okay, so you're mentioning it's a, a timeout here. Let's just check that. Yeah, right, okay. So you've got a very small example and it's timing out. That's uh, definitely not right. Um, let's take a look at your source code then. So talk me through what you've got here. Yeah, so um, this is just a classic parser combinator implementation. Um, you can see that I've got alpha. Alpha is going to uh, check for one of A to Z, um, and that's going to be a character. Otherwise, it's a digit, which is from 0 to 9, or it's an alpha num, which is either alpha or a digit. Um, and then uh, identifiers are basically uh, many alpha nums or lead the, lead, uh, with an alpha at the beginning. And the interesting ones here are the expras. So you've got an expression. And that's either going to be an add followed by an expression followed by a character, uh, which is going to be the plus or minus and then a terminal, a, a term. And then we can carry on down with uh, terms being moles, uh, which goes down to the negate clause. So I, this looks pretty standard to me. I don't know what could be going wrong. Right. I, I think I know what the problem is here. I think it's left recursion. Um, let me elaborate a little bit. I've got an issue that uh, that will help clear this up. So hang um, on. Left recursion in the extra term? Yeah, in the expert term. In fact, also in your term term as well. Um, so this is uh, this is the problem you've got, basically. If you imagine this is a BNF, uh, this would represent something like BA star. Um, but it doesn't work for parser combinators. So if you see here, we've got bad equals bad then blah, blah, blah. The problem is, in order to evaluate bad, you have to evaluate bad, and then bad, and bad, and bad, and so on, and you'll never make any progress. Okay, so if that bad had been on the right hand side, um, so it's something like char A, char B, then bad recurse, that might have worked? Yeah, so that's the sort of idea, yeah. I mean, you can do grammar transformations to fix this, but I don't really like that because it exposes the implementation details. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing is actually that uh, parser combinator libraries usually have something for this. I realized that actually I haven't pushed it into the repo. So let me just do that and then I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so it is up. Uh, let's just go to that commit and I will uh, just illustrate um, what I mean exactly. Okay. So I've added these two combinators, chain R1 and chain R1. They both have the same type. Essentially, they take a P and an op. The op has a function that combines results. And they'll pass p op p op p op p op p until they run out, and then uh, they'll apply these operators either left associatively or right associatively, depending on uh, the letter that's in the name of the chain. Ah, I see. Okay, so you basically want me to re-implement the expra and term so that I'm using chain l instead, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. good. I can patch that up. Let me have a quick um, code. All right. So let me push that. And I think that should be pushed. It's on its way. There it is. OK, talk me through what you've done here then. OK, so if you just expand that, then see how I've uh, replaced the expra there that's on the left-hand side. And rather than having these recursive calls to expra, uh, the self-recursive calls just disappear altogether because they're taken care of by the chain R um, uh, combinator by itself. And uh, where we've got term as the kind of leaf, the final leaf value on the left, that becomes the parameter to this chain R. And the yeah. operations are either going to be plus or minus. So I basically say it's add char plus, which passes the plus and puts it into an add, or a sub char minus, which does the same with minus. Uh, and term is basically a simplified version of that. Yeah, OK, there. Yeah, this looks correct. I mean, um, this is actually a bit more efficient than your original one anyway, because it doesn't have to repeatedly try and read expos. Let's check on the um, on the actual 
uh, CI and see what happened. Oh, so it looks like it's failed the CI still. Let's oh, have that's a look. surprising. What, what's happened there? Oh, right. Um, so we've got uh, an AST here, neg of num0. It looks like the parser has failed when it tried to read a space. Yeah, unexpected space. Have you handled white space at all in the grammar? Unexpected space. Oh, I see what's happening. No, I haven't done anything with uh, white space at all. I kind of just naively followed the BNF and forgot all about spaces, really. Right. OK, there's, um, there's also an issue for this as well. Um, which gives us a little bit of guidance. So yeah, uh, you haven't actually dealt with the tokenizing part. Usually parsers are parser and lexer. In parser combinators, uh, they're usually done at the same time, so there isn't two separate stages, which is probably why you've forgotten to handle white space. Right, um, yeah. In order to keep this nice and clean, what I would recommend is splitting up into lexer and parser. And then um, if you make your lexer expose your sort of primitive tokens like numbers and identifiers uh, and a couple of other combinators for sort of dealing with white space um, implicitly, then um, then everything should work out a bit nicer. OK, Does that make sense? yeah, I think I get the idea. So you want me to basically uh, make combinators that deal with white space um, and use those rather than just parsing the characters directly. OK, I'll yeah. write a patch for that. Okay, cool. Okay, I've just finished it. Let me push. There we are, it's on its way. There it is. Okay, um, so talk me through what you've done here then. Let's check okay, you. Okay, so I guess the important part really is going to be the white space uh, combinator. Uh, and there I'm saying that white space is basically um, when you satisfy that something is a space many times and then you wrap that up in a void to make the types work out nicely. And then I use white space in the definition of lexeme below. So lexeme of some parser P is basically that parser followed by white space. And a token, uh, which is what we had um, in the, um, the error, is basically where you try to do a parse um, first and then you, um, you make a lexeme out of that. And the reason we try is because you want the parser to uh, roll back if you fail at any part of the token. And um, yeah, so that will make the token atomic, right? Exactly, yeah, it just makes it atomic. So that should be about right. And then if we actually go to the parser itself, um, then uh, I'm basically saying all you need to do is you need to parse fully. And what fully does is if you go back up, um, it uh, checks to see if you've got some white space, uh, then it does the parser itself and then checks for EOF. So that's sort of fully parsing a string at the beginning. Okay, yeah, that looks good. And then if we look at the rest of the parser, Okay, so you've just added some tokens around. Exactly. So we've just replaced, um, uh, we've just added token surrounding everything so that we're protecting those things and dealing with white space implicitly everywhere. Okay, great. Uh, let's check on the CI then. Hopefully things are working out okay. Oh, it looks like they're actually still failing. Um, oh. Okay, what's, what's going on this time? So we're taking in var negatex. Ah, uh, right. Classic issue. Hang Classic on, what, issue. What does negatex mean? So this is just a variable name that our unit tests are using. And um, what we can see here is the pretty printed result from our parser and what we expect it to be. So it looks like our parser is actually splitting this uh, identifier, negatex, into negate of x, um, which is not the same as the actual variable itself. So basically, the parser is reading negate and then is, uh, isn't is sort of accounting for the fact there's an X following it, which should form part of an identifier. Oh, so the problem here is that when you've got some kind of keyword like negate, you want to make sure that it's definitely followed by no, no uh, nothing other than space, right? Yeah, a space or, um, or also, you know, a plus or a minus, something that's just not a, a valid trail of an identifier. Okay, so if it's not followed by some kind of alphanumeric, it's probably good. Yeah, that will work for here, yeah. Okay. And um, how would I implement that? I would uh, just make a, a, a special keyword combinator that just patches it up. Okay, let me try that. Okay, I've just pushed. Hopefully that's uh, going to fix that issue. Here it is. Nice commit message, by the way, very descriptive. Yeah, thanks. It's amazing how fast you can type. Of course. Um, okay, so let's walk through what you've done here. It's uh, pretty simple, this one. Yeah, so basically, uh, I'm saying that a keyword k is basically some string k not followed by an alpha num, and we make that a token. 
and I'm making sure that inside the parser itself, uh, negate is searching for a keyword negate, and that'll prevent it from having things like negate x being swallowed up into a negate x, which is obviously nonsense. Okay, cool. Uh, let's check on the CI then and see if, how that's going. Okay, it looks like we've got a bit of a wait. Actually, while, uh, while you were fixing that, I realized there's a bug in the pretty printing code, um, which I've also fixed. I'll just show you while we're waiting um, what happened there. So essentially, the, the pretty printer code um, forgot to add parentheses around uh, the actual parentheses node. Hang on, I'm seeing um, things like strong here. I don't quite know what that is. I've been working with just the usual AST. Right, yeah. Uh, let's go check those out, actually. Um, it might be useful for you. Uh, so there's there's two types of AST. So you've been working with the weak one, right, which is uh, a data constructor for every uh, part of the grammar, but they're all part of the same data type, and everything's sort of the same types all the way down. Exactly. We're parsing into an expression, and the constructors just um, mark the different yeah. non-terminals in the grammar. Yeah, exactly. So the pretty printing team decided that that's a bit uh, it, it would be a bit better if it was a bit more fine grained because it allows them to work out where parentheses go a bit easier. So they created a data type where each grammar rule is actually its own data type. And um, they're linked together by these uh, combining constructors. Oh, I see. So we've got the mutually recursive rules in BNF and all the non terminals there now correspond to different mutually recursive data types. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it also encodes the fact that add is left uh, left associative because the extras appear on the left of the constructor as opposed to the right. I see. So this the types here basically make sure that the grammar is exactly followed by the data type that we have here. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so obviously they'd they'd slightly gotten it wrong um, where they just missed out the parentheses because it's the same for every single one. Okay. Um, but it shouldn't have changed the CI, though it looks like it has. Oh, that's strange. Right, so we're failing again. It looks like if we pass it an expression um, like this, uh, where there is a, you know, a sub on this side and then an add, it looks like our parser is actually returning it um, the complete wrong way around. Hang on. Fact, yeah, it just looks like things so, have been switched. So the data constructors up there say add sub num zero var two. So I guess that that would mean it's a left associative um, value. Yeah, um, it should be. Oh, but then the output is right associative. right associative. Okay, so our parser is somehow doing it right associatively when it should be left. That's it. That's very strange. We did fix that, right? I thought um, so. Let's, let's have a look at the limit. Yeah. Uh, do you spot it? Ah, <laughs> okay. That's a newbie mistake. I wrote chain R instead of chain L, didn't I? Yeah. You wrote L in the commit message, but yeah, it looks like uh, you've used your chain R. Okay. That's actually quite annoying. Um, yeah, I mean, you could fix the typo, but it doesn't really stop you making the same mistake again. Yeah, it'd be nice if that could be somehow caught uh, so that I couldn't even make that mistake in the first place. But it, I can't see how that can be done with chain L and chain R. No, I mean, you could use the strong AST, but that doesn't have the right types to, to fit into chain R and chain L. Remember that they have the type A to A to A, but say as is now expert to turn to expert. Right. They don't quite match up. That's okay though. I've actually got some special combinators I've been playing with that should help with this. Let me just uh, push those up and we can see how they differ from the regular chains. Okay. Okay, here they are. They're called heterogeneous chains. So here I've introduced infix L1, infix R1, prefix and postfix. If we just remember the chain L1 has the A, A to A to A and goes back to A. And if you just ignore this parameter for a second, we can see that this one has a, B to A to B to B, and this one is A to B to B to B. Oh, that's a so bit like fold L and that... fold R, right? Exactly, like fold L and fold R. And just like fold L and fold R, the Bs represent what the associativity of that operator is. In this case, it's left associative, and in this case, it's right. And what about that first parameter? Right. So the first parameter just sort of patches the hole where um, where that final value is. You can kind of think of it like the K in the fold. Um, it transforms essentially that very final value of type 
A from the P into one that's a B that sort of matches with the right hand side or the left hand side. Oh, I see. So it replaces. This is going to be. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be the leaf type inside my grammar. So in that case, it's going to be the constructor yeah. that goes down to the next mutually recursive data type. Okay. I think. Exactly. I... So that's the of term of negate of atom or indeed parentheses if you were going that far down. Okay. Let me um, write some code to try and fix this up. So. Uh... Okay, that's been committed, and hopefully you'll receive it in just a second. Yeah, looks like I've got it. Okay, so what have you done? All right, so uh, basically we're trying to replace chain R, which should have been chain L to start with, with this infix L. And if I write infix R there instead, it'll scream at me and say there's an error. And yeah. the only thing I need to add really is to tell it how it's going to move from the type extra to the type term, because if you look at the type of the parsers, they've now changed. And that's using the constructor that goes down to the next level. So the of term or of negate, uh, or even parens, which goes right back up to the top of the um, the, the, the expression. Uh, and that's yeah. basically it. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, like you said, if you change it to an R, this definitely went type check. So this is a bit stronger. Let's um, let's check on the CI. I mean, hopefully, with the associativity uh, remaining as it is, this should all work out okay. Uh, let's just have a little wait for it to go through. I guess while we're waiting, is there anything else left in this parser that's that's kind of bothering you? I mean, it, I think at this point it's correct. Yeah, it seems um, absolutely right. But I mean, obviously it's a little bit verbose, isn't it? Because when we compare this to the ordinary BNF, you wouldn't expect to see nonsense like token char plus or uh, right, token yeah. char minus or keywords, etc. I mean, it seems like that's a bit redundant, but maybe we have to live with it. Yeah, I, I mean, you could com you could combine the token and the keyword combinators together by you know checking whether the string you pass to them is a is actually a member of some key set or not, but it still doesn't remove the fact that there's going to be this text lying around next to the strings. I don't know if you've got any ideas about that. Hmm. Maybe this is a good um, use case for overloaded strings, right? Overloaded strings. I don't think I've heard of that. Oh, okay. So that's just a GHC extension that allows you to type in strings. And although they they look like strings when you type them, they're not of type string. You use a type class to coerce them into something else. So we could type in strings like plus or minus or even negate, and then have that actually farmed off to a function that does the right thing, which is exactly what you described. Right. That's actually really cool. Um, well, let's let's try that out. But first, let's check if the if the CI has worked. Yeah, that's a green check mark for us. So everything is now working. Okay, so let me do some code for the um, for the overloaded strings and push that. So there you have it. It's on its way. It's uh, working its way through the pipes. Yeah, it's been pushed through. There it is. Okay. Okay, talk me through what you've done then. Well, so basically I've taken your idea um, and um, implemented it inside the isString instance. So the idea is that a string, um, if it's an element of the keys, and keys is just a list here containing all the keywords, right. then we know it's a keyword. So we just farm it off to the keyword function. Otherwise we want it to be parsed as an ordinary token. So we can just um, put that in as a token as we did before. Um, and if you just scroll down to the rest of the code, you'll see that what I've done is basically removed almost everything that was in the old parser and replaced it with just strings. That's beautiful. That's actually really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is looking really close to the original BNF now. Yeah. How satisfactory. So, I mean, we've done a lot of different lessons here. I wish there was a place where we could go to to kind of just um, find all these patterns and um, and make use of them while writing parsers. Well, you say that you've been coding really quickly throughout the whole of this, um, and I've actually been writing all the stuff we've been doing. Um, in fact, I've got a paper ready for us now. Let's take a look. At the Haskell Symposium, how wonderful. At the Haskell Symposium, yeah. Um, so I've, I've started out with our, you know, our original examples and, uh, and the problems, and I've shown the steps we've taken to resolve them, um, describing clearly the problems that we've encountered at each step, and what the solutions are and where different solutions exist. I've listed out more of them. There's a lot of goodies in here as well that uh, we haven't discussed in this PR, but we can save that for another day. Wonderful. Well, tables. looks like a really useful paper. I hope lots of people will read it. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time uh, today. looks like we'll be able to merge that into master um, a bit later on and get the product shipped. Thanks to you too. Catch you later. See ya.